Well, hello. We're getting kind of into the afternoon. Is everybody hanging in there? Doing all right? It's kind of tough, isn't it? It's a journey, right? So we're, we're going to talk about some, some choices uh, when accepting the changes that dementia brings uh, with, with our loved ones, with, with the people we care about and that we're trying to provide care for. So we're talking about exactly that, the, the changes that would be affected by the care. So what are the options, care options? And we're going to talk about a lot of things, and I guess the reason... Um, I thought this was an interesting topic when it was when it was brought up is because I think as somebody working in healthcare many times we have people that approach us looking for answers um, to really difficult questions uh, as it applies to their loved ones and it's just healthcare's a maze it's really hard to figure out what's what and what's available out there and so I think uh, in Northwest Arkansas, we're all really fortunate. We've got some really good people that work in healthcare here that want to provide those answers, uh, resources, so that so that you can get the help that you need. You know, when you're when you're struggling. So, um, so that's what we're going to talk about. Is is kind of some of the options. We'll talk about what's available uh, when you've got somebody and and their needs really have begun to exceed what you can provide. You know at at your level, at home. And uh, so we'll talk about a lot of things. And, and hopefully they can stay at home for a long time, maybe, you know, through the, the journey uh, of, of this horrible set of diseases that we call dementia. So uh, having said that, you know, as, as we think about the disease, the syndrome of, of all of the diseases uh, that fall under that umbrella that Betsy was talking about earlier, uh, called dementia, uh, there's, there's some commonalities there with all dementias. And we'll talk about those in just a little bit. So things are changing, and they're going to change. And uh, unfortunately, we know that it's going gonna, it's gonna to get worse. We know that. There's, uh, you know, there's all kinds of statistics and, and, and everything available that tells us it's going to get worse. We know that at some point. It's just a matter of when is that going to happen? What's going what's gonna to be the, the, the trigger that causes that? We were just talking about that during the break. Um, significant events in your, uh, in your life, possibly. It could be, as, uh, as Betsy was talking earlier about, you know, major surgical procedures and all of the, the chemicals that are involved with that. I mean, you just never really know what it's going to be, but we do know that we're going to get there. We just don't know when it's going to happen or what's really going to be the result of that. So, you know, as you get to that point to where you've got to do something different, and, and when you think about doing something different with your loved ones, that's uh, most often uh, probably the most difficult decision you're going to have to make in your life. It's frightening. There's so many unknowns. You don't really know what, what to expect. And, you know, of course, you hear various things, and, and, and you know, that just kind of adds to that. There's a lot of stigma, you know, when we talk about health care, especially when it applies to Alzheimer's and dementia. I think we understand that. People that work in, in health care, um, we understand that, you know, you're – challenged as loved ones going through that process. Could you hit the slide? My clicker's not working. So really important thing to remember. Uh, as we're working with people who have Alzheimer's or some other type of dementia, they're not giving us a hard time. They're having a hard time. And you've heard a lot of things that would certainly uh, kind of ring right in with that. There's so many things happening that they're struggling with. It's just not going to work. So we've got to help guide. You know, we've got to help provide the guidance, you know, through that process. Next slide. So just a couple of little statistics. So between uh, the year 2000 and 2015, deaths from heart disease have increased by 11%. That's bad news, right? Deaths from Alzheimer's disease have increased by 123%. And the, the really, I guess, interesting thing when you think about that is that not too many years ago, we didn't even think it was a terminal illness, but we know it is now. We do know that. 
123% increase. So 5.7 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's disease. That's one type of dementia. It's the most prevalent one, one type. 5.7 million Americans, and by the year 2050, you can see that, you know, the projection, it's almost going to triple by the year 2050. So this is not going away anytime soon. It's, it's, it's a problem. It's, it's right there, and there are not very many people uh, in America that have not been affected in one way or another, you know, by Alzheimer's or some other type of dementia. Next slide. So we were talking earlier about some of the commonalities. So there's four key points that, that I kind of uh, really like to talk about because I think they're consistent with all types of dementia. And so when we're talking about uh, the brain is failing, we're talking about at least two regions of the brain, major regions of the, of the brain. And we'll take a little tour, a short tour of the brain here in just a little bit and talk about some of those regions. But at least two regions are failing, which basically means that they're dying. So we've got parts of the brain that are dying. And <clears throat> unfortunately, once they're gone, there's no way to bring them back as we're sitting here today. Uh, there's, there's no way to do that. It's a progressive illness. It gets worse over time, as we've said uh, several times today. So it, we know that it's going to get worse. It's a chronic condition, which means it's a prolonged sickness. So what's the cure for Alzheimer's disease? St still don't have one, right? Still don't have a cure. Uh, and it's a terminal illness. It's the sixth leading cause of death in America. That is a staggering statistic. Every time I say that, it's just hard for me to believe that, but it is true. Six leading cause of death in America. Amazing. Next slide, please. So we were talking about those major regions of the brain. So we're going to take a, a quick little tour of the brain. Uh, they're color-coded up there for you. Uh, but before we get into those major regions, there's one little part of the brain that's really important. Uh, and several people have kind of been talking about this earlier. We're talking about our ability to retain short-term memories and information. Next slide, please. That's called the hippocampus. It's a little bitty part of the brain. It's a really important part of the brain, and it has a couple of really important functions, but the most important thing is that part of the brain is what helps us convert information and retain that short-term information. And unfortunately, it's one of the first parts of the brain that's affected in most of these dementias. So when that's damaged, we don't have that ability. So we can remember things from long ago in our past in, in pretty good vivid detail, but we can't remember what we had for breakfast this morning, and it's because we've got trouble with our hippocampus. So if you'll kind of imagine, and, and for some of the younger people in the room, this is going to be hard for you to really work with me on this, but you know, there used to be this thing called a tape recorder, right? Before all the technology. And so it's almost like a tape recorder that's being erased from now going back in time. That's our brain with dementia. So if that kind of puts it into perspective for you, we can remember the old stuff, but we can't keep the new stuff. It's not going to be able to be retained. And moving forward, that's why uh, the question about uh, the repetitive questions, we can't remember we've asked those. That's why we're doing it again and again and again. Next slide, please. So uh, the color codes, as we mentioned earlier up there, the, the blue, that's your frontal lobe. Uh, the purple, uh, that's, that's your temporal lobe, your left and right temporal lobe. Uh, the parietal lobe, that's the top of your brain up here, um, controls your senses. And one of the things, uh, when that part of the brain is damaged, I think that a lot of times we have what's uh, what would really be characterized as a hypersensitivity to certain things, to touch, um, to the pressure of water in a shower sometimes. So sometimes when we see a lot of these really adverse uh, reactions to really common things that we do every day, and we try to figure out what's going on, why is that happening? Well, I think in a lot of cases there's a physiological explanation for that. So. You know, top of the brain, senses, hypersensitivity. Uh, the, the most sensitive parts of your body are your mouth, your hands, your fingers, your feet, your toes, and your genitalia. And when we're, when we're getting in the shower and we got water pressure or if somebody's helping somebody with the shower and we're helping getting cleaned up, we're touching all of those areas. And sometimes we get these really adverse reactions, and it's not because, you know, necessarily that 
you know, we're upset or, or anything like that. It's that hypersensitivity. So back to the frontal lobe and the left temporal lobe, these two parts of your brain right here, that, that is your ability to communicate. It's all right here. So earlier we were talking about at least two parts of the brain, major regions of the brain being affected. If it happens to be the, those two parts of the brain, then our communication skills are eventually going to be completely gone, changed forever. And a significant challenge early on in that process. Uh, a lot of other things uh, with the frontal lobe, you know, your, uh, your, your problem solving abilities, your emotional functioning. So sometimes uh, when we have uh, somebody that has Alzheimer's or some other type of dementia, they'll cry or laugh um, uncontrollably. And so perhaps that part of the brain has been affected. Uh, so the left temporal lobe, we talked about our ability to process uh, language, our ability to understand language, facts, processing facts. The right temporal lobe, that's our ability to process visual information, and it, it controls your ability to recognize faces, familiar faces. So when that part of the brain's been affected, that's when, uh, you know, we don't remember somebody that we should remember. And so many times I've had family members ask me that question, why does she not recognize me? I just don't understand. And so there's changes going on in the brain for sure. Now on the right side of the brain, there's three things that are retained on the right side of the brain that are really important that you need to, to probably remember because they'll help you, I think, in a lot of cases. And so those three things are autonomic speech. That's just normal social chit-chat. So if you have a benign conversation with somebody that has Alzheimer's or dementia, and you don't really say anything that requires any critical thought, you might think, man, he's really with it today. He's on top of it. But that's autonomic speech. It's, reserved, it's preserved on the right side of the brain until very far down the road in the disease. The second thing is music and rhythm. And that's why you've heard uh, you know, Betsy talking about music earlier. Music is really important with people that have Alzheimer's or dementia. It touches different parts of the brain, and it's going to get some impact back to you positively. Most of the time, um, as you are looking at folks, even in the, the latter stages of the disease, if you play an old familiar song to that person, if they can't communicate and can't really engage at all, you'll see their foot start going, and they're, and they're getting with it. It's there. It's still there. Use it because it brings joy to their life and they really appreciate that. The third thing that's preserved on the right side of the brain is all those forbidden words that we hear throughout our life. Cuss words, sex talk, racial slurs, ugly stuff that we hear. We, we know we're not supposed to say those things, but our brain hears it, so it processes it. Oh, put that on the right side. But when all these other parts of the brain are affected and that's all you're working with, that's why you have these sweet little ladies will call you everything but a milk cow. And they never would have done that in the prime of their life because that's what they have to work with, okay? So the, the back of the brain. Uh, the back of the brain uh, controls our visual field, our ability to make things from a visual standpoint. And I think one of the things <clears throat> that's really misunderstood about a lot of these dementias is the fact that there are a lot of visual deficiencies for most people that are struggling with the disease. I think it's more pronounced than most people realize. Um, I think that your visual field for us, for you and I, for normal folks, if we put our hands out here, we can see this out of the corners of our eyes, but that starts to decrease sequentially as people process their way through the disease, and then it's here, and then it comes to a cone shape, and eventually, it's almost like you're just looking through a set of binoculars, and then one eye's gone, and it's one monocular, and then, uh, you know, it's pretty much gone. And <clears throat> I think you need to really keep that, you know, at the forefront of your thoughts as you're going through your days, because you'll see that uh, if you focus on people directly from the front and make eye contact, uh, you're going to have a whole lot more success than if you're thinking that they still have all that peripheral vision, because they don't. Okay, um, next slide, please. All right, so, so what are the options? And, and really, kind of before we get into exactly what the options are, uh, we need to kind of talk about when's it time, you know, to do something different. Next slide, please. 
So signs that it's time. That, that first bullet up there, you know, you can only do so much. You're one person. And I, I, you know, I've, I've had the, the privilege today to talk to a lot of family caregivers here that are doing a wonderful job with what they do. But you're only one person. And you can only do so much. And at some point, you're going to get... You're going to get tired. You're going to need to take a break and get your batteries recharged. So you need to have, you know, a relief mechanism for doing that. Um, it's physically demanding, taking care of people, providing personal care for all of those normal activities of daily living. It's, it's, it's difficult. So if we have an increase in the, the physical health needs of our loved one, uh, the memory, memory loss um, is... As, the, as we progress, we lose more capacity in the brain. Our brain controls everything that our body does. Our health is going to continue to decrease as we go along. Safety concerns. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people that, uh, that I visit with and that some other folks in here uh, that are working in healthcare, when, when people come see us, Typically, I know something, it's, it's probably something bad's happened, probably, a safety issue. Somebody's wandered out of the house in the middle of the night, and we couldn't find them for a short period of time or something like that. Decline in hygiene. It's just not of interest, or we, you know, we're, we forget to do it. We think we already did it. We told you we've already done it. We're not, we're not going there. We're not taking a shower today. I already, take, already, already had one. You've never heard that before, right? This group over here, never, right? <clears throat> they're, they're definitely in a situation where they're more vulnerable to somebody that's trying to take advantage of them from a financial standpoint or any standpoint, really, for that matter. We know that our decision-making skills are severely hampered and damaged, and our judgment is just, it's just not competent any longer to make good decisions. <clears throat> Challenges with shopping, and the, really, I guess, the, the big thing is memory loss that affects your normal daily living. If, if, if the memory loss is such that we're having problems to the point that we just really can't live a normal life on a daily basis, and you can't help with that any longer, then it's time to really kind of look for some, some different avenues, some different options. So what are some of the options? Next slide. So this is just kind of a list. We'll kind of talk about some of these briefly. We'll run through some of these. So if it's still safe and you can still do it and they can stay at home with you, that's awesome. That's, a, that's the best option. Um, home care, adult day care, or adult day health care. You know, hospice and home health, these are things that can be provided in conjunction with what you're doing at home or, uh, you know, in any of these uh, facilities, independent living, uh, assisted living, memory care, specific uh, communities, skilled nursing facilities, um, continuing care, retirement communities, which are now called life plan communities, uh, behavioral health, and then, of course, there's a lot of other resources out there, too, through the Veterans Administration, through organizations like the Broyles Foundation, um, all of these folks that work for these legal firms that were here today that provide services when it comes to, uh, to things that are really important and are going to be beneficial to you. Th those are there, too. So there's a lot of resources out there. There really are. Next slide, please. So staying at home with family tends to wear you down physically and mentally over time. Can be some safety issues because you got to sleep at some point. You got to get some rest. You got to take care of yourself. Is there enough family available to provide the care? And do they know what they're doing? Can they safely provide the care? It's the least expensive option, but you got to kind of ask yourself, how much is your time worth? Can you do that? Everybody does not have a situation where they can do that. Times have changed, you know, in our country pretty significantly. Um, how long do you think Alzheimer's disease has been around? Does anybody know? When was it first diagnosed? Anybody know? Take a guess. 
you're pretty doggone close. It's 1907. So it's been around for a minute, right? So it's been here, but, you, you, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we, we, we took care of our people because everybody wasn't working like we are nowadays. So it's a problem. Things have changed. Our culture's much different than it used to be, so we can't really uh, do that. Next slide, please. So home care, uh, several home care companies here today. Um, I used to work in the home care uh, business, and I can tell you that the folks that are here, they're all very good at what they do. Good options there uh, for, for helping you out. They can provide personal care, which is assistance with those activities of daily living, bathing, showering, toileting. A lot of the things that came up today as issues and challenges with folks um, there are some restrictions on, on some things that they can or cannot do, especially when it comes to medications and things like that. Um, some of the home care companies have some provisions in place to take care of that, and some do not, so that would probably be a question that you might want to ask. Payer sources. Typically, it's going to be private pay. A lot of them accept uh, Medicaid. Some don't, and some are... Um, some have contracts with the Veterans Administration where you can receive some home-based care through the Veterans Administration. Long-term care insurance policies, most of them will pay for this type of, of care, home care at home. Um, cost, typically uh, nowadays it's kind of a range and it's, it's about 20 to $25 an hour. Anybody, I thought I saw some home care people. Did you leave? Everybody left, I guess. Okay, I think that's right. Next slide. Okay, so adult day care or adult day health care. So in Arkansas, there's two different types of setups, and that's them. The adult day health care, the only difference between that is really more ability to administer medications than, uh, than with the ADC. It's personal care and companion care. Um, there's not a lot of opportunity around here. So I'm sorry, what's the name of your organization now? What? Yeah, used, yeah, I'm getting used to the new name. I'm sorry. So, um, so typically private pay or Medicaid, if, if you're licensed, which these guys are, I know they are, then they can provide Medicaid services. Uh, there may be some VA paid benefits as well there. Typically the cost, uh, it's, a, it's a half a day or a full day that you guys work with, I think. Maybe do some hourly stuff, but usually it's a half a day or a full day, and that's typically the cost. Um, you know, the $40 is on the half day side, and the $100 would be on the full day side. And their rates, I'm not sure exactly what they are, but I bet you they're right in there somewhere. Uh, minimums typically apply, and, and they do with a lot of these services. Uh, and so when we're talking about a half a day or a full day, we're talking about you know, are you going to stay for lunch or not, and meals, and so they can plan and make sure they've got enough for everybody. Next slide, please. So home health. So home health will really complement, um, and they can come to your home. They can go to a facility. Uh, home health, the difference between home health and home care, home care, it's the personal care and the companion care. Home health is really skilled services. We're talking about physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, skilled nursing. If your loved one has a wound or something like that, they can come uh, provide some assistance to help that get better. Uh, they can do that at home or in a facility. The payer sources for um, home health, that's going to be pretty much any insurance source out there, Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, uh, we'll also pay for that. It's intermittent care, and they'll usually come visit a couple, two, three times a week. It can involve some personal care also in addition to that. Next slide, please. Hospice. So uh, the hospice companies here uh, in the area, you've got really two options. Uh, they can come to you. There are some of the, the companies here in northwest Arkansas that have inpatient facilities that you can go to. Um, so they provide also skilled nursing, aides to come in and help with, uh, with the, uh, the personal care. There's a lot of resources there with hospice. And when people really think about hospice, I think there's a lot of negative connotations really with hospice because what do we think about when we hear hospice? What's the first thing we think about? But it doesn't have to be that way because that's not all of the services that they provide. 
they can provide palliative care as well. So palliative care is about improving quality of life. That's not about death, right? You know, hospice itself, you know, that piece of it, aside from the palliative care, that's about comfort care, you know, in the, in the end of life. There has to be orders written for home health services and these hospice services, um, payer sources, pretty much the same as, uh, as home health, Medicare, Medicaid, VA, private insurance, they'll accept private pay as well, but it's, it's pretty expensive, I think, if you check. Um, and since we're talking about pri or, uh, all of these payer sources, as we're talking about those in general, if you don't know or you need to know what it costs or what these folks accept, the best thing to do is before you start the services, get the answer to all of those questions. They'll work with you and, and tell you what it looks like on that end of things. Next slide, please. So independent living, uh, several independent living communities here in northwest Arkansas. Um, there's, uh, you know, here in, in, in Rogers, we've got a couple. There's, uh, there's one down in Springdale. There's one in Fayetteville. Um, there's uh, some uh, options in Bentonville as well. And, of course, I think there's going to be more of these options for independent living. So this is for seniors who... Um, who can live on their own, and obviously if we're talking about somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia, it would have to be somebody in the very early stages of the disease. So for most of you, that's probably not going to be uh, a good option based on some of the discussions that we've had today, but it may be for others. And so there's a wide range of services provided there, housekeeping, um, you know, social activities, dining, transportation, a lot of different things uh, available there. And depending upon where you live, uh, the, the cost, it's, it's pretty much private pay, and that's the range that you're looking at, somewhere between $1,800 and, and $6,000 a month. It really just kind of depends. It's all over the place uh, when, when you talk to these folks. It's, it's typically a situation where you're coming in, you got a monthly rate, and then what you select as services that you want to have offered to you uh, would be added on to that. Next slide, please. So assisted living, an assisted living facility, it's a housing community for people with disabilities uh, or for adults who can't, um, can't live independently. And so assisted living, it's been around since, since the, you know, the, the early 80s, I guess. Uh, there was a lady that that had a, a very young mother at the time. She was 60 years old, and she was living in a nursing home. But she thought that, you know, there has to be a better option for her. But there really were not uh, that many options back then. So she kind of came up with the concept. She lived out in the northwest, Oregon, I think, uh, is where she lived. She was a doctor. And so she came up with the concept for a place that's kind of in between independent living and, and a nursing home for people to go that need a little bit of assistance but, you know, not at the nursing home level. Here in Arkansas, we've got two levels of assisted living. There's a level one and a level two. The level two is the higher level of care than the level one. Um, it just really kind of means that you have more nursing on your staff than, uh, than the level one. Payer sources, private pay, long-term care insurance. Some assisted living facilities, except Medicaid, all of them do not. So if that's something you're looking at, that's certainly something you'd want to ask. Cost is between $2,400 and $4,800 a month, roughly. Next slide, please. Then you got memory care communities. So in Arkansas, these are assisted living facilities, level two assisted living facilities. Uh, they're also uh, certified as Alzheimer's special care units. So that's an additional certification uh, that uh, not just memory care communities might have. There are some uh, skilled nursing facilities in the area that, that will have a section of their facility that's certified as an Alzheimer's special care unit. <coughs> um, the, the memory care communities, there are several standalone communities here. There are three in northwest Arkansas, but there are a lot of other folks that provide memory care. There's a lot of other assisted living facilities, and as I said, some of the skilled nursing facilities that provide some degree of memory care as well. Um, so home health and hospice can come into those facilities to provide those services. Cost, typically, for, from a payer source standpoint, you're looking at private pay, for the standalone memory care communities, absolutely, it's private pay or long-term care insurance. 
Uh, there are some other things that can factor in there, but that's pretty much it, and that's pretty much the range. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more expensive than uh, your normal assisted living facility and probably about in the range of a skilled nursing facility. Next slide, please. So skilled nursing facilities, healthcare institution that has at least one full-time RN. I can tell you that all, all of them that I've ever been in have way more than one. So uh, you got a bunch of nurses with a bunch of different duties in there. There's a lot of things uh, that have to be accomplished on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, all uh, of those facilities either offer in-house physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, all of those home health things, or they have somebody coming in to provide those services. And those home health and hospice companies can still come in to the skilled nursing facility. So we're skilled nursing facility. Some people would call that a nursing home. It's a skilled nursing facility. That's, that's what we're talking about. Payer sources, uh, as Todd Watley was talking earlier this morning about the Medicaid impact, um, all, all of the skilled nursing facilities have Medicaid as a, as a payer source. They do have private pay um, for the long-term care section of the facility, and that's kind of the range in our area. It's around $5,700 to $7,200. Um, they'll accept long-term care insurance, and the Medicare piece of that, um, there is a little bit of that. That's for, for rehabilitation when you're coming out of a hospital, but that's going to be for a short-term stay, and that's it. It's not going to pay for the long-term care side of that, just as, as he was saying this morning. I think that's a real common misconception that, you know, I've got great Medicare insurance. It's going to pay for my stay at the nursing home, but it's not going to do that long-term. Next slide. So life plan retirement communities it used to be called CCRCs. Uh, so it's kind of a, an area where you have a lot of these different things that we just talked about in one place. You've got independent living, assisted living, typically have some sort of memory care and a skilled nursing facility all in one location. Um, there's typically an entrance fee to get in. Some people call that a buy-in. It's called an, it's really an entrance fee. And then you have a monthly cost to stay there as well. So we have one life planned retirement community in Northwest Arkansas. Anybody know where that is? Butterfield. Butterfield. Yep. That's it. So, um, you know, payer sources, that's, uh, that's pretty much private pay on, on that end of it. Obviously, some of your, your insurance can help with some other things while you're there, some other medical services that you receive. Next slide. So behavioral health. So, you know, a lot of people, when I say behavioral health, they look at me like, oh, you know, there's absolutely a benefit uh, to the behavioral health side of things when we talk about Alzheimer's and dementia for some people. And <clears throat> just right before the break, we were talking about some, some medication uh, issues that are not going on. This is one of the, the biggest benefits that the behavioral health folks can provide is they can figure out what's going on with those medications and get it all re-regulated so that it's working the way that it's supposed to. So, you know, it's there is there is a situation where, where it makes sense. And obviously, if we have a change in the level of functioning, if for whatever reason we've become violent or really aggressive to the point that we can't control it and it's a scary situation, they can help with that because a lot of times that's what's going on. It's a medication thing. It's a lot of chemicals going into your body, and with this progressive disorder, that changes how all of that stuff is regulated in the body from time to time. So sometimes we have to do that. So safety issues, you know, all, all of those things that we talked about before, but more specifically when there's a big change and certainly if it's become a dangerous thing. So, so a lot of times uh, as I talk to people, they say, well, you know, when stuff like that happens, it's like, it's like on the weekend or at night. How? What do I do in those situations? So what do you think you should do in those situations? What do you think? Absolutely. Call 911. Go to the emergency room. They'll help you figure it out from there. And if it's a situation where maybe behavioral health is what you need, they can provide the referral to help you get there so that you can start getting better from that point moving forward. And when I say getting better, I'm talking about addressing what's going on right now. Does that make sense? Do they advertise their 
Yeah, we do. Uh, there's there's actually several. So we've got um, <clears throat> you know down down in Fayetteville, you got Springwoods. They're a behavioral health hospital. They've got an inpatient uh, area down there, and they do have a section that focuses just on uh, on seniors with you know Alzheimer's, dementia, and other behavioral issues. Uh, there's also a vantage point. They have an inpatient uh, um, piece as well. Um, there's also some outpatient programs with some of these folks that they can uh, really help, you know, on a, on, a, on a day program where you can go in. So if you've got questions, I would just call and ask. And, and there's absolutely some other options out there as well as far as that goes. Next slide. So uh, veterans benefits, community resources, you know, and this is really kind of more from a funding standpoint. There's some aid and attendance benefits through the, the veterans organizations. Every county in the state of Arkansas has a veteran service officer or officers. And so typically that's going to be in the courthouse. Um, I think that's where they're still located in Benton County, down in Washington County. They're actually in a little building um, that's off of the VA campus near the, the veterans home there, and they have several people in there that can help you with a variety of things. The VA CRC program, that's a community residential care program. There are uh, a couple of, um, a couple of the, the facilities in Northwest Arkansas that partner with the VA and provide some additional benefits for inpatient facilities in the program. There are home-based programs uh, that can help, like we said earlier, with, with home care and, and other things as far as that goes. There are some respite grants out there that are available. If you need to get some money for somebody to stay temporarily somewhere, several of our uh, communities and facilities in Northwest Arkansas have respite programs where they can take people on a short-term basis. Usually that's going to be for 30 days or less. If you've got something going on where... You just need a break. Yes. That's that's not that's not correct. And uh, there's several that do. Um, Linda, do you guys do any respite over there? I don't know if you do or not. We do. Yeah. Yeah, and, and several of the skilled nursing facilities have the capability to do that too, so I would just ask. But there's a lot of folks that do respite care in Northwest Arkansas. You know, I'll just leave that right there where you left it. So, yeah, actually, we have a gentleman in our Fayetteville community right now on a, on a respite stay. So, typically 30 days or less, so it's short term. Uh, so, if you're a sole caregiver and, and you have a medical procedure, for example, and you're not going to be able to provide those services on a short term basis, you can reach out to some of these folks and they can help you out, you know, in the interim while you're uh, recuperating. Life's still going on. You know, if, if you've got a, a graduation to go to out of state and it's not going to work for you to travel with your loved one, that might be another opportunity to do that as well. And um, the, the respite programs are awesome. And those grants that I was talking about, there's money out there to, to help finance that if you ask for it. Everybody doesn't qualify for those. Everybody has different requirements. But if you don't ask, you don't get, right? So I would ask. Um, all kinds of counseling programs out there. Obviously, uh, you know, the folks here at the Broyles Foundation do a fabulous job of, of helping uh, families through these situations and answering questions and providing guidance. Uh, this meeting center, another excellent resource here in the area. There's a lot of resources here that are available. There really are. Uh, a lot of caregiver support groups. Those are for families uh, or anybody that wants to get a little more education or just go somewhere so they can have some, you know, some conversation about the topic, and there there are a lot of them. So, um, how many are you guys involved with, Betsy? Okay, and and those are where? Yeah. 
okay? And there's a lot of other folks that, uh, that have support groups. There's, there's one at Avenir as well. There's several, several folks that have those. So that, those are awesome opportunities. doesn't cost you anything but some time, you know, to go really sit down and, and, and visit with some people that are pretty knowledgeable and an opportunity to ask questions and get answers and, and just really kind of talk about what's going on because sometimes that's really healthy for us to do too. Next slide. Okay. Questions. What questions do you have? Questions, comments? No questions. Yes. Yep. <clears throat> so, so let me put it to you this way, um, and and we we had this conversation earlier today. So, and we talk about this a lot with our employees as we're training, as we really try to think about all the emotions that are involved with these tremendously important, huge decisions as to what you're going to do. I mean, I don't think many people wake up in the morning and go, "I've got it." got it all figured out. I hope I really have Alzheimer's disease and I want to go to a place where there's a bunch of other people, you know, with the same thing. It's nobody's going to want to I mean I, I can't blame them. I mean it's a, just a that's a human a natural human response to that. People don't want to be helped. I mean not and especially this generation, right? Nobody wants to be helped. Nobody wants to be dependent upon somebody else. So that is, a, that, that is a, a great question, and it's so difficult to handle those situations. But I, I think what you got to do is you got to kind of take a step back and look at it for what it is and, and not so much say, we're going to take you to this place because you got Alzheimer's and that's where you got to go. Obviously, you can't do that because that's, that's just not going to work. I think... It's different for everybody, and a lot of times I think uh, there's so many negative connotations with a facility out there that when, when you try to even have that conversation, and I, I get it, I get it, uh, I've, I, I mean, I have these conversations with my parents all of the time, and so I get it, and so of course I get, I'm, you better not put me in a place, you better not put me in a place. I go into a place. So I know that that's going on, and I think that's what we got to get away from. It's really because that's not what it is. It's changed over time. This has evolved. We have some beautiful communities here in northwest Arkansas that do a wonderful job of taking care of people and meeting their needs. And so I think, uh, you know, when we, when we look at it from that standpoint, you got to find the best fit, you know, for what, they like to do because there's a it's not just it's not just going into these places and uh you know somebody's you know i mean there's a lot to do there's a lot of activities there's a lot of cool things that they can do they can still have a productive life just because they have alzheimer's disease doesn't mean it's over it's just changed a little bit but from a safety standpoint and to make sure that they get the the health care that they need you got a whole staff of people to help with that. So I would just say how you communicate that to your mom, that's up to you. You need to think that through, and you know what's going to be the best way to do that if you really think about it. And a lot of times kind of a test run is, is the best way to do that. Go on one of those respite stays for a little bit. See how it works. You know, you got to leave. you got to go out of town. So she's going to go stay somewhere at a vacation resort for the weekend. I'm not a big believer, just like Betsy. We, 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 do, we do tell some white lies on occasion. But we only do that as a last resort when we're talking to people because Betsy used a really good example of where if you get caught doing that, you're really in trouble and you're done with whatever it was you're trying to do. So we only do that as a last resort. However, it really kind of would be a resort, right? So I don't think that's a lie. You know, there's actually a, a clinical term for that, Betsy. Do you know what it is? Does anybody know what it is for a white lie? Is it? 
therapeutic ver pre-verification. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, we don't like to say the word lie, so we use therapeutic pre-verification at our place, right? Creative communication. There you go. Exactly. I, I, I don't know if that helps or not, but... Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, I'm <clears throat> I'm a really big believer in asking for help from people with the disease. I don't like to tell people what to do because I don't think you get the results that you're looking for, but if you ask for them to help you do it, I think you get more buy-in when you do that. Everybody wants to help somebody, right? So <clears throat> so that's what that's what we really teach and try to practice. It's, it's not directive because that doesn't, because nobody does like that, right? That's not going to work as, as well. So, any other questions? Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. I know it's been a long day.